currently enrolled in uh, currently enrolled in a Bachelor of Science in Immunology. Uh, by interest, it includes cooking, eating whatever I cook, uh, enjoy hiking and skiing as well. Uh, I don't have any pets or dogs, but when I'm able to get my own, I'm definitely going to get a corgi. So my presentation this week is going to be on caffeine. Caffeine is found naturally and artificially in a lot of things. It's found naturally in plants as an insecticide to deter herbivores and also to attract pollinators for reproduction. I was found in tea leaves, cocoa and coffee beans, and also added to foods. Uh, plants have evolved to produce caffeine through convergent evolution across multiple species. And that's the picture on the right to show uh, the plant species that have evolved to produce caffeine. Uh, it's the most widely used psychostimulant drug in the world. 80% of Americans consume caffeine every day, and around 30 consume multiple caffeinated beverages a day. Uh, coffee is the most widely consumed drink in Canada, actually, uh, excluding water. And it's estimated that around 5 million 60 kilogram bags of coffee were consumed in 2022 in Canada. So for the metabolism of caffeine, the normal half-life is around five hours, but that changes based on an individual's lifestyle. Uh, that can be diet, medication, alcohol use, or genetics. Metabolism of caffeine is increased by things like smoking, and it's decreased by things like oral contraceptives and pregnancy. Uh, so the effect isn't increased, it's just that the caffeine molecules present in your system longer if you are pregnant or shorter if you do smoke or drink alcohol. Uh, it's rapidly absorbed through the GI tract in liquid form, but the fastest or most effective way of caffeine delivery is through caffeine pills or caffeine gum. Uh, this allows absorption through the oral mucosa. Uh, even in liquid form, though, you get 99% absorption of caffeine into the bloodstream within 45 minutes. So it is very fast acting. Uh, in terms of further metabolism, 75% uh, of caffeine is metabolized to a molecule called perizanthium, which is a low toxicity molecule, and then it's excreted from the body. Overall, it causes alertness, awakeness, and an increase in energy and focus. So how does caffeine actually work? Caffeine is an adenosine homologue and ag agonist. Uh, adenosine is produced from the breakdown of ATP, which is an energy molecule, and it signals the body to feel tired and sleepy, among other things. So caffeine binds and blocks these adenosine receptors, which will inhibit signaling. Uh, it also leads to an overall increase of cyclic AMP, which then goes on to promote some pro-energy pathways. An interesting fact, uh, adenosine receptors have been found to co-localize with dopamine receptors in certain parts of the brain. And this might be another explanation for how caffeine can increase uh, focus and attention, but these specific pathways still have to be studied more. Um, the optimal caffeine use is to ingest caffeine around 90 to 120 minutes after waking up, in addition to viewing sunlight right after waking up, and this will have the maximum effect of caffeine and the maximum duration while avoiding that kind of mid-afternoon crash that a lot of people have after drinking coffee. So a few common caffeine misconceptions. Number one, caffeine is addictive. And caffeine isn't really addictive, but since it is a neurostimulant, uh, someone who habitually uses caffeine can develop a slight dependence. That being said, given the other stimulants people get addicted to, uh, caffeine is fairly mild, so any withdrawal symptoms are fairly light. Uh, number two, drinking coffee can give you cancer. Coffee and caffeine has never been shown to have a causative relationship with any type of cancer. Um, there is some suggestive evidence for caffeine use in bladder cancer, but the study uh, was the data from that study was 
just under statistically significant. So it still remains as suggestive evidence. Caffeine use has also been shown to be inversely proportional to melanoma and oral cancer. But again, that study, the results were also just above statistically significant. Uh, number three, caffeine causes cardiac arrhythmias and hypertension. Caffeine's not been proven to cause any sort of cardiac arrhythmias. However, it does lead to a slight increase in blood pressure, which goes down to baseline within the next two days. And this increase was only shown in patients who haven't recently had caffeine in their drinks or food within the past 24 hours. Uh, number four, too much coffee in one day can kill you. That is technically true. Um, but for the amount of pure caffeine to be a toxic dose is one teaspoon, and that is the equivalent of around 40 to 50 cups of coffee. So unless you're drinking 50 cups of coffee in a day, you're probably not going to die from coffee. Uh, however, the recommended maximum daily caffeine intake is 400 milligrams a day, which is around four cups of coffee. So caffeine uh, and its role in resistance exercise. So along with binding to adenosine receptors, caffeine binds to ryanodine receptors in muscle cells, and this increases calcium release, as well as decreasing calcium reuptake. Uh, this works to increase muscle contractility and force. Results show that 300 milligrams of caffeine has an increase in the patient's one rep max weight for both bench press and squats. The study also found that caffeine increases both power and velocity of repetitions at 80% of one rep max weight for those same two exercises. Patients who used caffeine daily or habitually showed no decrease in the pre-workout caffeine results. This was kind of interesting because it showed that you don't necessarily develop a tolerance for caffeine in terms of its physiological properties. Uh, they determined that the optimal caffeine dose for ergonomic and uh, effects since exercise is 1.5 milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight. This gives the greatest effects with the, the greatest effects with the lowest side effects. Uh, so there were two uh, clinical studies that I found were pretty interesting. The first one was how caffeine can be taken with a painkiller to increase the effects. The pain measured was mainly severe headache, postpartum, and postoperative pain. It was a double-blind study, 10 patients minimum, where caffeine and the painkiller were taken at the same time. And all of the patients over all of the different reported pain types reported relief with the caffeine plus painkiller versus just the painkiller alone. Uh, it's believed that the effect is mainly mediated through, again, adenosine receptor binding and blocking of pain receptors to decrease any pain inputs. Also, uh, caffeine will increase the blood flow, gastric blood flow, which will lead to increased drug uptake. And the second study is the role of caffeine in, in preventing Parkinson's. This was tested in mice. Caffeine was uh, given along with a drug called MPTP, which essentially gives mice Parkinson's and causes them to develop Parkinson's symptoms. So mice who had higher levels of caffeine along with same level of MPTP showed less symptoms and less onset of Parkinson's. However, this hasn't been tested on any non-human primates yet, so there is room for further studies. And it's believed that, again, adenosine receptors are responsible for this. Uh, in the brain, adenosine receptors are responsible for glutamate release, which is a molecule that's neurotoxic in high conditions. Caffeine will bind to the receptors and block this glutamate release, protecting the nigral neurons, which are generally targeted during Parkinson's. Uh, and then the link at the bottom is for a podcast on caffeine by uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman, who's a professor at Stanford, and he explains really well 
how caffeine works and the other uh, physical and neurological benefits to using caffeine. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks, Nicolin, for the nice presentation.